The auerbach kotlikov model, economic model and computation part two, value function iteration. Hello and welcome back to the second part of our video tutorial here on the auerbach kotlikov model. We have analyzed a 60 period overlapping generations model. Uh, each period corresponds to one year. So we have 60 different cohorts alive in each period and we studied the steady state. Therefore, we had to solve the individual optimization problems. It was a complex problem, uh, can be described with the help of 99 nonlinear equations and 99 unknowns, and we used the newton repson algorithm in order to solve it. Now, this algorithm was fast, this method was fast and reliable and accurate. But unfortunately, it's not always possible to use it. So in the case of more complex problems with very heterogeneous agents, with a high number of possible paths for the individual profiles on consumption and, you, and wealth, uh, this might become too much of a computational burden. So we have to rely on other methods. And one possible method that we will look at today is value function iteration. It relies upon the discretization of the individual asset space. So we do not just compute the profile for one individual, then for the next, but we just compute something like a policy called a policy function. So this gives the optimal next period savings, the next period at wealth level, or and an optimal labor supply as a function of the individual state space, which is, in our case, just wealth. So we only need to keep track of the wealth level of the, of the individuals and how many people, for example, hold a wealth of 1.0, 1.1, and so on. And this will help us to compute the resulting equilibrium much easier. So let us get back into the model. Let me just briefly review the characteristics, the equilibrium, equilibrium conditions of our model before I introduce you to value function iteration. So please load the slides for chapter 9.1 from the book Dynamic General Equilibrium Modeling into your, your computer and uh, follow me through the slides here. This chapter is taken from the book that I've written with Alfred Mausner, Dynamic Genetic Equilibrium Modeling, Computational Methods and Application, in particular, chapter 9.1. So let us briefly review the model. We have a household that is born at age one, which corresponds to year 21, uh, to the year 20 in real life, he works 40 years, then retires 20 years. His labor supply as a worker is denoted by LST, his labor supply at age S in period T. And his lifetime utility is the sum of the utilities over the different years, over the different periods. And the discount factor here is beta. So and utility at age S in period T is a function of consumption C and leisure one minus L. We use a very simple instantaneous utility function, a cop Douglas function, C in consumption C and leisure one minus L. And we added this constant here, psi, to consumption. So to allow for the analysis, the computation of the special case where income is zero and we consume C equal to zero, then our algorithm, our computation does not fall apart because we do not have to, to consider a negative number or zero to the power of minus one. We have to, uh, a budget constraint at young age. When we are a worker, we get labor income earnings WT, LT, which are taxed at rate tau t, our social security tax. We have assets AST, which yield the return RT, and we use it for consumption CS or for next period savings AS plus one. In old age, we do not get earnings, uh, wage income, but we get P. 
tensions instead. And we have derived the first order conditions here, 5 and 6, and solved them. Now let's get to value function iteration here. Before I present to you the idea of value function iteration, we need to consider two additional elements that we will look at, that we will need in our value function iteration. One is linear interpolation, and the other one is an optimization routine in one variable, goal and section search. So let me briefly describe linear interpolation. We will have, for example, an optimal policy function, labor supply or savings or consumption, as a function of the individual as, uh, asset here. Uh, so we basically have a function f of x with the argument x. And we will store the optimal policy function at grid point, let's say x1 and x2. But of course, we also would like to compute the policy function between grid points at a point x. And here in this case, in the, in the figures you can see, we will just do linear interpolation. So we have f of x1 so, and f of x2 tabulated these two values, and we just compute f of x by using linear interpolation. Of course, we are not exact, and this is of of course, a source of inaccuracy in this model that we need to use linear interpolation. We cannot store our optimal policy functions here at all grid points. The second element that we need to consider is goal and section search. So we want to maximize, find the maximum of our function. Let's see, we have a function f of x and we want to find the maximum x star. And we know that it's somehow located in the interval a, d. So this is taken from the book Dynamic General Equilibrium Modeling, section 11.61, where we describe this method. But it's such a standard method in numerical optimization that any book on computational methods will consider it. Now let's assume we have picked two values, b and c. How shall we proceed? Well, we know that the optimum, the maximum, is in the interval AC. Why? Because B is the larger point. We have the larger function value at the point B. It's larger than the function value at C. So we know it must, the maximum must be inside this interval A of C and we use this as the next interval where we look for x, x star and introduce a third point. We call it b1 here. And co compare again the function values at point b1 and b. Now, if the function value at b point is the larger one, then we use this interval, a b a1, B1, and B. If not, we use the interval B1, C1, and D1 as our next interval. Therefore, we shrink the interval around the maximum and always discard the right or left interval limit depending where the, where the larger value is located of the two inner points. Okay, now the question is, how should we pick B and C? And there are two, two assumptions which are, necess which are useful. Well, we do not know in advance where we end up, whether the optimal interval is AC or BD to search in the next round. So as it makes sense to choose these two interval of equal length. AC should be equal to BC because we do not know where we end up and we do not want to end up in a larger interval in, an, uh, in a case that's not really convenient. So we choose these two intervals the same size. AC equal to BC. 
So in the next iteration, we pick the value B1. So we have the new interval A1, B1, C1, D1, and compare B1 and C1. And again, we should have the same principle, but A1, C1 is as large as B1, D1, so that we do not end up in an unfavorable interval, which is larger than the other. So it should copy the proportions of A, B, C, D should also be the same proportions as A1, B1, A1, B1, C1, D1 in the next step. So the links of A, D relative to A, C should be equal to A1, D1 and A1, C1. The same holds if we end up in the interval, in the, if the maximum, for example, lies here, and we end up in the interval B, D, that the links of the of the here of A, A2, D2 and A2, C2 is equal to AD and AC. When we impose these two restrictions on our procedure, we find that there is an optimal ratio of these of the distance AD and AC, the ratio of these two distances. And this distance is called the Gohn ratio, and it is equal to 0 0.618. Now, the advantage of this method here, the Gohn section search, is that it's really reliable and converges to a relative maximum. Of course, if we have many maxima, well, we can end up in the wrong one, but if we have a well-behaved value function, and this is the case mostly, at least here in our application, this is the method that's reliable and robust. And we will use this method, go in section, section search, in our optimization routine. Okay. Now, we provide a function in MATLAB that's called Golden and a procedure in Gauss that's also called Golden, where you have to provide the function f and, two, and the interval points a, c, and an intermediate point a, a and d, and an intermediate point c. And from then on, this Golden section search will find the maximum with a specified accuracy. Now let us go into the value function problem. And consider the lifetime utility of the household at the age one in period T. We look at the steady state, so we dropped the time index. And here in 21, we have just the discounted lifetime utility over the 60 periods of the of the newborn household, subject to the budget constraints. And given initial wells A1 equal to 0, and final wells after that A61 equal to 0. Now let us call us the controls, and the state variable denotes denote, that our state variable is the individual wells level AS. Our control variables in this problem, in this optimization problem, are the labor supply and the consumption at age S that we can choose in order to maximize our lifetime utility. Now let's define a value function. A value function is the greatest feasible lifetime utility from age S forward to the end of the life in period T. So formally, the value function is the supremum of the life time utility for the remaining years. So we are uh, S years old, and we just sum up the instantaneous utility from age S on until our final period of life, uppercase T, and sum it up and discount it with the factor beta. Here we have the supremum. In our case, this is equal to the maximum, so we have well behaved um, utility functions, we have closed sets to solve, to choose our labor supply from, from 0 to 1, and this results in the fact that here in our case we have the maximum 
which is a special case of the supremum. Uh, we have well-behaved, nice, smooth function, differentiable function. So um, in case you're not familiar with the supremum, just assume that our problem is well-behaved and we use the maximum in the following. Now let's consider the person who's 60 years old and dies in the next period. So if we are in his last period of life and he knows he consumes all his pension and all his wealth and all the interest that he earns on his wealth because there's no need to save anything for next period. He will be dead anyway and he has no bequest motive. He's not altruistic with respect to the next generation. So wonderful, the household knows what to do. The labor supply L60 is zero, so that his leisure is equal to one. Next period wealth is equal to zero, and his consumption is equal to the pension income plus the interest income, R times A60, plus his wealth, which he consumes completely. So we can substitute this into the value function at age 60, which is simply the utility in his last period of life. The his lifetime income at age 60, his remaining lifetime is just this one period, so the value function is equal to the last period utility function. We know how much he consumes, and this provides us with the value of the value function. Notice that it's a function of a 60, of his beginning of period 60, age 60 wealth level. So his wealth function at age 60 only depends on his state variable wealth A60. Now let's look at the household who is 59 years old. His lifetime utility is the sum of utility at age 50 plus discounted utility at age 60. His control variables are consumption at age 59 and at age 60 and he faces the budget constraint that, depending on his consumption at age 59 and age 60, he's left with wealth A60 and A61. And A61, again, is equal to zero. So this is the value function of the 59-year-old. And now comes the beautiful insight from a man named Richard Bellman, who looked into this so-called dynamic programming problem. He noticed that you can identify, of course, the utility at age 60 with the value function at age 60, and it only depends on, as we have just seen, on the asset level at the beginning of age 60. So we can replace utility at age 60 by the value function at age 60, which is now a function of the wealth level A60. And end up with a so-called Bellman equation where we have lifetime utility, the value function at age 59 is the maximum of the sum of the utility at age 59 plus the value at age 60 discounted by the factor beta. And here we just maximize over C59, notice, because uh, consumption at age 59 implies the age at the wealth level at age 60, and this implies our value of the value function at age 60. So we have reduced this two period, two control problem into a period, into a problem of in one control, and we have split up, divided this maximization into sub problems where we just looked at in, uh, at optimization at age 59, while simultaneously determining wealth level at age 60 and therefore our remaining lifetime utility. Let us shift this problem again backward in time and get to an retiree at age S, and this age is now 41, 42, up to 49. We can decompose it into consumption at age S and uh, instantaneous utility at age S. And consumption at age S implies next period asset, A of S plus one, and this implies the value of the value function, V S plus one given 
for words a s of 1 discounted by the factor of b term. So that's the famous Bellman princip principle of optimality. We break the optimization problem, which, for example, for the 41-year-old retiree is an optimization problem in 20 controls, C41, C42, C43, up to C60, into much simpler subproblems, just maximizing instantaneous utility with respect to the current controls, consumption at age S, which implies next period wells and therefore the value of the value function. So by breaking up the value function problem from a 20 or 40 or 60 dimensional optimization problem into a one dimensional problem where we just choose optimal next period, uh, optimal current period consumption CS. Of course, for this we must have computed the value function in the, in the next year, Vs plus 1. And we will do so, and we will just store it, save it at different grid points. And when we maximize this, of course, we, this might be, a, of course, only a grid point with probability 0. So we end up between two grid points, well, and then we interpolate between our tabulated values to compute the value of Vs plus 1, A of a s plus 1 and have therefore transformed the problem into a, an optimization problem in just one variable, which we solve with golden section search. Okay, now let's go even back further in age, so go back in, in, in time and look at the worker who between age s of s1 and 40 and his value function is the instantaneous utility at S plus next period value of A of S plus 1 discounted by factor beta subject to his budget constraint. So if the worker has now two controls, his consumption and his labor supply, and the two already determine next period wealth according to his budget constraint and therefore the value of his value function Vs plus 1 next year. Now how do we solve this problem? Well, let's look at the Bellman equation of the worker and substitute his, inter, his budget constraint for consumption here. So here we have 1 plus R times Rs plus 1 minus tau WLS the net wage income minus next period wells minus a s plus 1, his budget constraint. So we have c plus s. And look at this Bellman equation and the optimality condition. So let us assume that the value function is differentiable and that maximum value is an interior value. We will look in the computer program what happens if it's not interior, but if it's at the, the credit constraint that assets must be larger or equal to zero binds so that the optimal asset is next period asset is zero. Now but let's look at the inner solution first, interior solution first. Then we can use the method that we know from calculus, from analysis, and differentiate the function inside the curly brackets with respect to the controls LS and consumption CS and derive our first order conditions, which are the first two equations here. So if we differentiate this equation with respect to C, we get the, mar uh, with, sorry, with respect to, 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 to L, the labor supply, we get the marginal utility from consumption times one minus tau times W, that's marginal utility of the outer, uh, the derivative of the outer function, 1 minus tau w, is the derivative of the inner function, 1 minus tau w, ls with respect to ls, is equal to marginal utility from leisure, and this is the derivative of this utility function here with respect to leisure 1 minus ls. The well-known first-order condition that you already know from our Lagrangian function, they exactly the same first order condition. Now when we der derive the 
maximum here, the function here in curly brackets with respect to next period savings, s plus 1, i s plus 1, we get that here the first that marginal utility you see that is the derivative of the outer function and the derivative of the inner function here that using the chain rule is minus one is equal to beta times the derivative of the value function at h s plus one v s plus one prime with respect to next period assets a s plus one. So these are our two first order conditions. And now we can apply, apply the so-called envelope condition. So we, this value function is, of course, uh, the, the maximum value of the lifetime utility for a given state variable AS. So if we maximize the value function with respect to AS, the left-hand side, the envelope theorem tells us, the envelope condition, that it's equal to the derivative of the right-hand side with respect to AS. So we have that Vs prime AS, the derivative of the value function at HS with respect to asset level AS, is equal to 1 plus R times that's the inner, uh, the inner derivative of the inner function. Sorry, that's equal to beta times v s plus 1 prime of, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry for this. So we do take the derivative of the right-hand side with respect to a s, sorry, not a s plus 1. So we got that the derivative of the outer function utility with respect to the first argument, that's marginal utility of consumption, you see, and the derivative of the inner function consumption with respect to AS, of course, is 1 plus R. So we derive the we have derived the envelope condition Vs prime is equal to 1 plus R times UC, UC at HS. Now when we lack this condition here, the envelope condition by one year, so we have Vs plus 1 prime of AS plus 1 is equal to 1 plus R times UC from of Cs plus 1 times 1 minus Ls plus 1 and substituted in the second first order condition, we see at once that it's our Euler equation. And the first equation here is our first order condition with respect to, to labor. So if we compare this to our, to our optimal condition that we derive with the help of the Lagrangian, well, it's just the same. So we derived equations 5 and 6 from the value function, from the di dynamic programming problem, the same, the same conditions, and we have the equivalence results, that's for example shown in Stokely Lucas with Prescott 1989, that these two optimization calculuses yield the same solution. Okay, so that's wonderful. No matter which approach we take, the value function iteration, or using the nonlinear equations from the Lagrangian, we will end up with the same solution. In our special case here with Cobb-Douglas utility, it is very convenient to notice that if we substitute our marginal utility of consumption, our marginal utility of leisure, into the first order condition of the household, our condition for labor supply looks like this. So we can derive labor supply as a function of this period wealth, AS, and next period wealth, next year age, wealth, A of S plus 1. And this will be very convenient. Okay, now let's go on and present to you, let me present to you the idea of value function iteration. We want to compute the value function V S of A S at H S S from 1 to 60 over the interval A, Z, A min to A max. 
we start by choosing the state space on which we would like to compute the value function. Well, we can choose a different, a different interval for each age, but how this might become cumbersome, it's possible, but we make a very simple assumption. We look at the same state space, individual state space at each age. So we choose a mean as our credit constraint. The lower bound of our wealth level is zero. And now we have to choose an upper wealth level. Now from our computer, of, of, of from our algorithm, let me show you the algorithm here again. We have started the algorithm, remember, by specifying an initial value of capital stock and employment. And we have found that employment is approximately equal to 0 0.2 and the capital stock is approximately equal to 1. Then we can compute the wage, the interest rate and the social security tax tau. And we now do step 3 and compute the optimal path for consumption, savings and employment, the optimal policy functions. That's the step that we describe now, the value function iteration step. Previously, we used the nonlinear equations with direct computation, we used the uh, new Repson algorithm. Now we use value function iteration. So in step one, we computed K and L initial guesses, and these initial guesses amounted to 0 0.2, and the capital stock, with the help of the first order condition and an interest rate of 4.5%, was approximately equal to 0 0.8. Of course, our interval here between a mean and a max individual state space must contain the average wealth in our, in our economy, which is 0 0.8. But of course, we also remember that over the life cycle, we accumulate savings for old age, so our wealth will increase above a level of, of 0 0.8. Well, but how, how much will it increase? Twofold, threefold, so that's approximately what we observe in, in our, our bach kotlikov model. Some people just have five times the wealth of average wealth. Some people are very rich. So we just start with the value of 10, which is about 11, 12 times the average assets in the economy. So, of course, when we are done with our computation, we have to check if this interval was large enough or, if, for example, the, the 60 year old or 50 year old or 40 year old, whether they do not accumulate uh, assets close to 10. This would then be an indicator that we need to increase our asset space. Now, since this is an infinite, uh, infinite number of points in this interval between a 0 and 10, we have to discretize it. So we have to choose grid points on which we compute the value function. We cannot compute it on every grid point that's in, in this interval because there are simply infinite, num infinite grid points. So we choose 200 equity, equity space grid points um, on the interval 0 and 10 so that they are approximately 0 0.05 away from each other. And we can only compute the value function numerically at a discrete number of grid points. Between grid points, we interpolate linearly, as I have shown you before. before. So we just use this linear interpolation method here, which is very easy. We, we store the value function at a grid point x1 and at a grid point x2 and when we want to compute if we want to compute the the value function between two grid points we use linear interpolation and because as we will see the value function of course has the same shape as the utility function and is concave uh, we are of the true value and we have an we have of course an approximation error here that's different in our case where we use direct computation because we only compute the optimal policy function at the exact point, at the exact asset level of the household. There we know we only have to compute the solution at point x, and this will, of course, reduce the approximation error, our accuracy, accuracy error and the accuracy.
So that's our first choice. We choose the state space, the grid over the state space, and choose the interpolation method, we choose linear interpolation. But it's easy to modify our computer program, for example, for cubic interpolation. Now that we have determined the interval a min a max over which we would like to find our policy functions, our value functions, and then our policy functions, how much we should consume, how much we should save, let's go to the next step and start at the end of a person's life, at age 60, and compute his value function. So we know that at age 60 we consume all our pension income pen, we consume all our interest income R times A, and of course our savings A, and we compute this for our 200 grid points AI. So from 0 to 0 0.05 and so on up to grid point A200, which is equal to the value of our uh, maximum in the interval, our upper upper limit a1 equal to 1.0, our upper interval limit. Now we take this consumption at age 60, C60 of AI, plug it into the instantaneous utility function u of c and 1 minus l. We know that labor supply is equal to 0 in old age, so leisure is 1. That's the second argument of our utility function, instantaneous utility function u. And we have our consumption C60 of A1, and we can compute the value of the value function at this, at this grid point AI. We do this for all grid points, and we are done. We have tabulated the value function at age 60. Now we go back to age 59. Therefore, we look at the Bellman equation. That's the next to the bottom equation here on slide 45. And we notice that our value at HS is simply instantaneous utility at HS plus the discounted value at HS plus 1. So for the 59-year-old, S equal to 59, we have instantaneous utility at age 59 and the tabulated value of V60 that we just looked at. So again, we, we use a grid over the asset space at age 59, A59, our 200 grid points starting from A59 equal to 0 up to A59 equal to 10, our upper limit of the individual state space, compute the solution to this value function, so the maximum of the right-hand side of the Bellman equation, with the help of an optimization calculator, and that's our goal in section search. So we have our given grid point at age 59, AI, and we just look at the maximum of AS plus 1, which yields the maximum value of the right-hand side of the Bellman equation, which is the term in the middle of the slides 46, Pension plus 1 plus R times AI minus AS plus 1 plus our, our number Psi times leisure, which is equal to 1, plus beta times the next period value function. And we do this over a search over AFS plus 1. So this is an optimization problem in one variable. We use go and section search and find the optimal next period asset AS plus 1 for each grid point AI, the wealth level at age 59. And we save these solutions as our policy function. So for our wealth at age 59 at point AI, we know the optimal policy function AS plus 1 and CS. And we also, of course, tabulate the values of the value function at age 59 at all grid points. And so we continue backwards in time, backwards in age, going from age 60 to 59 to 58 and so on. For the working agent, when we have age equal to 40, it's the first time that the agent also has 
endogenous labor supply, so we have an additional control labor supply. How do we deal with this? So here is the right-hand side of the Bellman equation that we would like to maximize for the working agent at age 40. So he gets wage income 1 minus tau WLS, interest income R times AI, the grid point that we consider, plus, of course, the wells at the end of the uh, that's left, AI, minus next period savings, AS plus 1 plus C. We have the labor supply 1 minus uh, the labor supply LS, which gives us leisure 1 minus LS. And we have the tabulated values of next period value function at the grid points AS plus 1. So what we do is we substitute our labor supply, our first order condition of the labor supply in this equation. And then it's simply, uh, sorry, in this term, and then this term is simply a term in the one variable, in AS plus 1. Now, we use again Gohn section search to find the optimum value. The value might be between uh, two grid points, AI and AI plus 1, and we interpolate linearly the value function between grid points and store again the optimal value function as a function of the state space, which is our individual wells. Notice that we impose one more constriction here. So far we have been a little sloppy on the optimization problem. We also have to check if our optimal condition here for the labor supply implies leisure that's large, uh, the labor supply that's smaller than zero, so that our leisure increases above one. In fact, this is actually possible for particular values of AS and AS plus one. This may happen in our, in our value function iteration problem. This was absent in the nonlinear equation problems because uh, our optimal wealth level did not imply such a solution. But when we search over a whole grid, this is a, a possibility. So we always have to check that we choose the maximum of zero and the right-hand side here, the second argument of this maximum fun function, which is our solution from the nonlinear equations problems without the constraint L larger equals zero. So L equal to zero may bind and we have to consider this. And again, we store the value function as a function of the asset space. And now we also store the additional policy function, our labor supply, and again, our optimal labor supply, as you can see from this equation here, is only a function of the individual labor supply at age S. Okay, and this describes the whole value function iteration problem. And we are done once we have computed the value function at age 1. Okay, and then it's easy to aggregate the capital stock and the labor supply in step four of our computational algorithm. Let's go back to the algorithm here and of our steady state. We have now computed the optimal path, uh, the optimal policy function for consumption, savings, and employment. And now we have to compute the optimal path, the life cycle profile. But we know that in the first period at age one, a1 is equal to zero. So we can use our results from the value function iteration, our policy function, compute next period value of our wells, A2, from the policy function with respect to savings. So this provides us with a value A2. Again, we can use this value of the wells in, at H2, use our stored policy function, which we have tabulated at a finite number of 200 grid points. A2, of course, lies with between two grid points with the probability, um, la, uh, does not lie on a grid point, but between two grid points. And therefore, we again have to linear, in, linearly interpolate our policy function for next period asset for our savings. And we continue like this and can compute the life cycle profiles for consumption, savings, and employment, and, and simply look at the average of these values to get aggregate capital stock and employment 
update our guess of capital and labor and return to step if this is not equal to our initial guess and just iterate over the aggregate capital stock and employment as we described in the previous video. So let us look at our results here. First, let me comment on the runtime. With Gauss, the computation with 200 grid points needs 32 seconds. If we increase it to, to, to 2,000 grid points, it goes up to approximately two to three minutes. When I use MATLAB, and I use the exact same command, so I translated my Gauss computer program into the MATLAB computer program, one by one, in a congruent fashion, then the MATLAB version from the year 2014, the release 2014, takes approximately one hour, 56 minutes on my computer. So it's, two, it's about uh, 120 times slower than Gauss. And when I take a more recent MATLAB version, a release from 2019, the computational time goes up to 27 hours, more than a day to compute the solution with value function and 200 grid points. So MATLAB is very slow, especially the more recent version, let's say from 2019 than from 2014. Therefore, I always work with the 2014 version. Um, for more sophisticated problems, I do not use MATLAB. I mostly use Gauss, and my co-authors often use Julia or Python and Fortran. So Julia, for example, is even about approximately 10 times for, faster than Gauss, so you need just two or three seconds to compute this value function iteration problem. And uh, you might want to consider this if you go on and try to compute very complex value function problems, for example, not just in one individual state variable like asset space, but for example, in multidimensional state space, where, uh, for example, accumulated contributions to the pension system might also become a state space variable. Now let's look at the accuracy, and therefore I've, I have uh, computed or graphed the consumption function here for 200 grid points, which is the black line here. And as you can see, it still oscillates in old age from year 60 on. And I have to increase it to 2000 points here, the asset grid, the individual asset grid, to get a smooth linear function of old age consumption. Uh, we know from our Euler equation that consumption in young age and in old age must rise linearly with a constant slope that's implied by the Euler equation. And uh, to achieve this, we need at least 2,000 points here. So this is a good way to check the accuracy of your computer program, consider solutions for different number of grid points. And then, of course, you also have to compute the Wells age profile, and we know this from, I haven't computed this for value function iteration, but for, for our, for our uh, direct solution method. And you can see here that the individual Wells level increases to a level to 1.7. So our upper limit on the individual state space equal to 10 was large enough, and we do not hit the upper limit. So that's reassuring, but after this exercise, we know, okay, we should use more than 200 grid points. But you should start with, with a low number of grid points uh, in case the, the computational time is so exorbitant, as we just saw in the MATLAB, with the MATLAB version here, the recent MATLAB version, uh, you don't want to wait weeks or months to find for the, for the computer program to find a solution. So just start with a small number of grid points and then increase it so that you get the inaccuracy that you are that you're comfortable with. Okay, so let me summarize what we find here from value function iteration. 
value function iteration is slow. It is very slow. Whenever possible, well, try to use direct computation with the help of the nonlinear equations that characterize our equilibrium. And you will find videos in this course here, in, late, in later, later sequence here, um, which looks at a much larger scale OLG model with a couple of hundred um, endogenous equations, nonlinear equations, and endogenous variables. So we will consider this for much more complicated problems than the one we do consider here right now, and still find a solution. But sometimes um, you can't help, but you have to use value function iteration when the number of heterogeneous agents in our model becomes too high. If we have, if we have, for example, income uncertainty, or so many different agents, for example, we look at family economics, people who have children, people who do not have children, people who become entrepreneur, stuff like this, and uh, different productivity levels, and of course, stochastic individual productivity levels, then you have to switch from the direct computation to value function iteration. And then you sometimes get into uh, to, into the place, get to, to a point where you notice, well, you simply cannot solve it due to computational restrictions if your individual state space is too multidimensional. So we had an individual state space which had just one continuous variable, which was wealth. But there might be additional, additional elements, additional variables that might enter your state space. For example, if we look at pensions, and the pensions on your pension will depend on the contributions that you undertake, well, you also have to keep track of the accumulated pension contributions, a second state variable. Or if we look at a model with endogenous human capital, some people might go to high school, others to universities, and others do a PhD or a postdoc research, and then you earn experience while you're working. So you accumulate human capital, and this might also become an additional state variable. And there are also other examples of state variables. For example, your health, if you keep track of your health level, and there might be shocks to your health, they might have become in bad shape, stuff like this. So our state space, our individual state space might be might have too, much, too many dimensions, and if we have three, four, or even more dimensions, we fail, at least with current computer technology, to compute the solution with an adequate accuracy. Okay, so that's the drawback of the value function iteration. It's too slow, and we only may consider problems, well, in my experience, and with current computer technology, too state variables, individual state variables, which are continuous, like, for example, wealth and contributed pensions are usually enough. Three state variables is sometimes already beyond, beyond uh, compute, uh, the computation, especially if our function is not really linear, but we have to, to approximate it at many grid points. If we have an individual state points, state variables where we just need three or four grid points because our policy functions are rather linear function of the state space, we are fine. But if we have a lot of curvature, well, then we have a problem. Okay, so this finishes our consideration of the method. And now we go into the computer program, into the MATLAB, computer program and the Gauss computer program and describe value function with the help of these computational prog programs that you can also download from my homepage. So let us get into the computer code. For the MATLAB user, the uh, program is called chapter 6 ak60value.m and you can download it from my homepage. So let me show you where you can get this file. 
There's a page on my book, Public Economics, The Macroeconomic Perspective. So even this chapter, this particular section here on the albach kotlikov model is taken from, from the book on dynamic general equilibrium modeling with Alfred Mausner. I also put the computer code here on my homepage to the book, Public Economics, The Macroeconomic Perspective, because this video here is part of a graduate course on social security and dynamic general equilibrium. So please scroll down this, the page to the various links and downloads that are associated with my book and go to the link download computer code and you will find the various chapter here and the MATLAB code in the last column. Go to chapter six pensions download zip file and let me open it for you. There's a directory, MATLAB Chapter 6, and please go into the directory Chapter 6 AK value and download the whole directory, store it in a separate directory. All these MATLAB scripts here, the function golden, M interest, R value, U for utility, and so on, you will need them in the same directory so that the program Chapter 8 6 ak value.m works. Uh, at this occasion, let me also show to you where you can download the slides to this tutorial. So there is a link teaching material, and in this link you find the extra material here, the Auerbach Kotlikov model download PDF. So just download the slides from this page. The link, of course, is provided here in the top. Okay, so we are back to, to our slides here. And now I would like to ask you to open your program chapter 6 ak 60 valuem in your MATLAB editor. If you have not done so, please uh, pause the video and load this program into your, into your editor. All right, and I will also take a second here to load it. And let me switch to the MATLAB editor. Chapter 6 AK value M. Now you should always run the program first um, to see if it works. Now let me also point out that I for this reason have set the number of grid points in lines 73 to 50. So the original version is 200, and we will also later use 2000 grid points. At least I will show you the results, or I've shown you the results. The problem with 200 grid points is that it takes too long to debug and go through it with you together. So I set the number of grid points on the individual asset space and a number of asset point grid points to 50. And let me run this program for you so that you can see the output. And this takes just a few seconds. Now we compute the value function and the optimal policy function in the first iteration over the aggregate capital stock K, Q equal to one. Now we are at age 41 and I introduced a pause statement so that you can study the value function of the 41 year old. And as you can see, it has such a nice concave shape it gets the shape from, from the individual utility, instantaneous utility function. Of course, this shape takes over to the value function as well. In the consumption function of the 41 year old is displayed in the next figure. Consumption is increasing with individual wealth, but here you can see, well, it's not really smooth. There's a small king here. So 
this already indicates that, that 50 points may not be enough. And here we have the optimal next period asset function, which is a nice linear curve. So next period wealth, AS of plus one, is almost a linear function of AS of individual wealth. And then we continue to compute the value function of the, of the I year old here, 30, 29, 27, and so on, up to age one, and again, we will display it. So you only ask to press any key in this first iteration, Q over the S, aggregate capital stock and aggregate employment. In the next couple of iteration, the program just runs through, so you don't have to do anything that it keeps on executing. And you can see the value function here, and now the consumption function of the of the 41 year old, sorry, this is the consumption function of the one year old, the title is for one. Uh, you can see here is a, a small irregularity at the upper limit of the individual asset space 10. Where does this stem from? Well, we have to restrict our next period savings to lie on the individual asset space on the interval zero to 10. And we also, of course, compute this for individual asset equal to 10 at year one and at year two and so on up to year 40. And for the worker, it would be optimal to even increase its wealth beyond the upper limit 10. And we have to restrict it to 10. The reason is very simple. Um, we have not computed the optimal policy function in the previous iteration of the S plus one year old at this value of the asset space. And later on, when we aggregate the, uh, the when we look at the transition path, the age profile of wealth, um, we have to compute next period wealth given this period wealth. Um, we cannot compute this for levels beyond the maximum of 10. So that's why we restrict next period asset to lie in this interval 0 and 10 as well. And this causes this irregular behavior at the corner of our interval. Therefore, you should always choose the interval large enough that your agents do not accumulate wealth at the end, at the upper limit of the interval because there we might have inaccuracy. But we will be fine. We will see that the maximum number, the maximum amount of wealth will be one point, around 1.75. So if there is some irregular behavior up in this interval, it does not inflict upon our accuracy in the results as long as we stay in the lower part of this interval. And this is the optimal next period asset. So as you can see, at the amount of approximately 9.9 .9 something, the optimal level is already 10, and then uh, it cannot increase further. OK, and as a new variable, we have the optimal labor supply. And you can see, of course, that this the labor supply also has this irregularity behavior at the top of the interval. Of course, our choice of labor and leisure depends on marginal utility of consumption and marginal utility of leisure, and both is a function of consumption. So, of course, the properties of these two policy functions are close to each other. OK, let us stop the, ex the execution here. Um, just type control C, and you can string C and you can stop the program execution. Now we want to debug the, pro, uh, the computer code, chapter 6, akvalue.m. And therefore, let's start in line 26 and place a breakpoint there. Just move the cursor on the hyphen that's associated with line 26. 
And when we now start our, our run of the computer code in the MATLAB editor, the execution will stop in line 26. So what have we done before? We just cleaned, cleared the memory, uh, closed all figure windows, and cleared the command window. Now we uh, use tick, uh, the command tick, which stops the computational time so that we know that our, how long our value function takes. In this program, we employ a, di a different method here. We uh, use global variables. In the previous MATLAB code, we used uh, a parameter vector par, which we passed on to the function. Here we use uh, a separate file, def global ak values. And let's step in here. And as you can see in this, in this script, we define our global variables, which we, which we will use in the functions later on. So for example, we have the minimum grid size, the maximum grid, uh, sorry, the minimum grid point zero, we have the maximum grid point more 10. Uh, of course, now we have, not already, we have not yet assigned values to these global variables, but we will do in the following. So let's step out of this of this uh, variables definition here. We set our interpolation method to linear. Here you can change it. You can, for example, also set it to cubic. Um, you may try this if you like. In the first part, we assign parameters. And all these parameters, like beta 0, sigma, alpha, the replacement rate, delta, are global variables, which we will pass on to uh, to the functions that we call. So beta is equal to 0 0.96, r is equal to 4.5%. Uh, the coefficient of relative risk aversion is equal to sigma equal to 2. Our production elasticity of capital is set equal to 36%, so that the capital share in total income is 36%, and the labor share is 64%. Our replacement rate of pension with respect to net average wages is equal to 30%. We use a depreciation rate of 10%, and we have 20 periods in retirement and 40 periods as a worker. You can see I've also used other values when I was writing down the code. I used two periods in retirement and two periods as a worker. So of course, then the model is much faster and it's easier to debug and you do not have to wait such a long time to, to get from one part of the model and to do the next part. In line 57, we compute the income tax rate or the social security tax rate. It's equal to 13%. This is implied by our replacement rate and by the measures of the old and the young workers, so we have two thirds of our population are workers, one third are retirees, and from this, our social security tax of 13% falls. We've set the disutility parameter from working equal to 2.0, and this implies an average labor supply of approximately 0 0.33. We need the small parameter psi in our utility function so that we can also. Be sure that we do not call the utility function u with consumption equal to zero. Uh, this way, we keep our computer execution from breaking down. We do not have to evaluate a negative or zero uh, to the power of, of a negative, uh, negative value. Phi equal to 0 0.8 is our updating parameter. So we start with the guess of the aggregate capital stock and aggregate employment. We find a new value in step four of our computer code. And we use 80% of the initial value, 20% of the new value to, to form the aggregate capital stock and aggregate employment values in the next iteration. We need a tolerance for the percentage deviation of the 
uh, of the two aggregate capital stocks in the last three iterations of 0 0.001. And we have an accuracy of the Golden section search equal to 10 to the power minus 8. Okay, and neg is a large negative value, minus 1 to the times 10 to the power 10. And we need this to initialize the value function. What we will do is we compute different values for the value function at next period capital stocks A1, A2, A3, and so on. And whenever we have a higher value, we update our, our guess for the, for the next period capital stock and use this new value for our value function, the implied value, and compare it with in the next iteration with uh, the next value for next period capital stock. And this is just a value for initialization where we can be sure, okay, it's so negative. Um, we start at least with one admissible value for next period capital stock. And Q1 is the maximum number of iterations over A6, uh, sorry, A60, we do not need this. And Q equal to 30 is the maximum number of iterations over K and F. Sorry, this is a leftover here from, from the code with a nonlinear equation, so we do not need this in this program here. Sorry for this. Okay, now we set the asset, the individual asset interval. It's between 0 and 10, between asset max and asset min. And we use 550 grid points so that our grid is equispaced equi starting from 0, 0 0.20, 0, 0 0.2, to 40, and so on, up to 10. And we want to have a column vector. And we also need a small constant, AFs which is between the first two grid points. So the first grid point on a grid is zero. The second grid point is 0 0.204. And we have a small constant 0 0.02, which I will explain later why we need this. We will use it to test for corner solutions. So if the minimum next period wells a equal to zero bytes. Step two in our, our algorithm, we initialize capital, labor, and uh, aggregate capital and labor. And we know this from the last video. We set aggregate employment to 0 0.2. We initialize our aggregate capital stock so that it implies an interest rate of 4.5%. So this provides the value of 0 0.8282. And we just need these two initialize these two values, which are the aggregate capital stock and employment. In the last period, we just need these two values to compute our criterion if we should stop the computation. So if these two, k bar and k old, are close to each other, and the deviation is less than zero, the percentage deviation is less than 0 0.001, we stop. And we also need to initialize our global variables k0 and k1, which will be the individual capital stock at hs and the individual capital stock or wealth at hs plus one. Okay, step three, we start our iteration over the policy function. So we have aggregate capital stock, aggregate employment, we have start iteration q equal to one, and here we compute our criteria. We stop when this criteria is above the tolerance of 0 0.001, the percentage deviation, the absolute of the percentage deviations. We also do a maximum of 30 iterations. It's always good to introduce such a statement in your wild statement that your program does not run internally, um, but or Q equal to 30, it should stop. So we compute wage and interest rate with the help of the aggregates, capital stock, and labor. So let me get step into this function. 
And as you can see, this function wage dot m is stored as a separate file. Now I have to do this because I'm using the MATLAB version from 2014. If you're using more recent version like 2019, you can store all these functions in your head program, in your main program, chapter six, ak value.m. This does not work in older version of MATLAB. That's, and because some of you might still have older version, I do it in this way that I, I save all these functions, also the interest rate m or utility function as separate scripts, as separate functions in your directory. For this reason, it is a good idea to also store all your programs in a separate directory, because remember in the last couple of programs, we used a different wage function here, which included a parameter vector par as an additional argument. And you do not want to MATLAB to get confused between these different functions. So store all your programs in a separate directory. And we use our global variables here. So let's step in our, into our definition, which is also a separate file. And here you can see that we stored, uh, for example, our production elasticity alpha here in our global variable. So we know the value of alpha here is equal to 0 0.36. It's a global variable, it's not a local variable, and that's why we defined it before. And we can compute this wage for our given capital stock 0 0.8282 and employment 0 0.2, our initial values, implying a value of the wage equal to 1.0674. And the same holds for our interest rate. So, and of course, our interest rate is equal to 4.5% because we have calibrated, initialized it this way. We can compute the pensions in old age, save K bar and K old, a K N bar is our old values so that we can compute in the next iteration, we can compute the percentage deviation of our new value and see and stop if this divergence is below our chosen tolerance of 0 0.001. Okay, now starts part four, step four, where we compute the individual policy functions. For this reason, we first specify the, uh, the value function of the retired, the optimal asset, the policy function of the retired, and also its, its optimal consumption. It's a matrix of the dimension NA times TR, so we have we compute our value function at 50 grid points at each age, and in retirement we have 20, 20 periods, 20 years of retirement. The same, of course, holds for the optimal two policy function, next period capital stock and consumption this period. So we have initialized it with the zeros. Now comes the initialization, the value function at the last period of life, at age 60. And this, of course, is period 20 of the retired. So after 20 years of retirement, in the 20th year of retirement, we just consume our, complete our pension. So what we do is, for each point in our, on our grid here, in our asset space, starting with point 0.0 and then with point 0, point 0.0, or four, 1, we compute the consumption that is associated with this wealth. We know that we consume the complete wealth plus the interest rate plus our pension. And let's get into the function here, function instantaneous utility, which we have also stored as a separate script. And we have computed our consumption equal to 0 0.0835. That is the consumption associated with the wealth level at the first grid point, which is zero. So C must be, of course, equal to the pension. 
and our pension is 0 0.0835. We use global variables. Our sigma is equal to 2, so sigma is computed with the help of the right-hand side of the equation in line 10. Notice that we have psi 0 here, so even if we pass on a consumption equal to 0, um, we do not get stuck in our computer code execution. And we have computed instantaneous utility of minus 10.8292. Let's step out. And this is the value of our value function in the last period of life at age 60, period 20 of retirement, if we have the initial capital stock zero. And we store the policy function and our our consumption is just that we consume our pension 0 0.0834. If we continue like this to initialize our optimal policy function, and our optimal value function. OK, so pose the cursor in line 126, and let's run to the cursor. Now we initialize the value function of the workers. And there we have T periods, 40 periods. So we work 40 years. And of course, we also need to initialize it for the 50 capital stock. So our value function of the worker is stored in a 50 times 40 matrix. Now we start the computation of the decision rules, the policy functions, the value functions for the retired at age 59, 58, and so on up to age 41, corresponding to the periods I equal to 19, 18, 17, and so on in retirement. We clear the screen, allocate the variable i to the global variable period, which we might pass on to our, our, our functions. And this is just a display command so that we know we are in the first iteration over the aggregate capital stock. We consider the h59 and compute the value function at this edge. OK. M0 is set to 0. This is a function that we keep track of uh, the grid point, which was the optimal value in the last iteration for the grid point, which is just below the present iteration. And this will help us to speed up our computation. I will get to this in a minute. Now let's compute the optimal value function of the 19-year-old considering the each grid point in turn. So we start with the lowest grid point at a grid of 1 equal to 0. So k0, our global variable, stores our asset level in the present period at h19 in this case. We initialize the interval for our goal section search ax, bx, cx with the value 0, minus 1, and minus 2. And we now try to find the, the maximum, so next period capital stock that's optimal, that maximizes the right hand side of our Bellman equation. And we want to bracket it by ax and cx as the upper limit, and bx is an interior point. We search these three points. Now let's do this together. We initialize the value of the value function at age 19 in retirement, so age 59 in our model, um, with wealth zero, with a grid of i, uh, with a grid of i a of a i a equal to one. And now we search for the 
good points that contain our maxim. So we start with the first grid point on our on our grid a grid on our asset space m equal to one, and look the look up compute the value of the right hand side of the Bellman equation for this next period value of the asset. So we have k zero equal to zero, k one equal to zero, and wonder what is the right hand side of the Bellman equation. And this is computed in the function value one. So let's step into the function value one. Value one is the value function of the or the right hand side of the Bellman equation with present assets k zero. This is a global variable, and next period assets x. That's the argument of the function. So k zero is equal to zero, x is equal to zero. We can compute consumption as 0 0.0835. Of course, it's equal to the pension that we consume. And it's larger than zero. And we can compute the right-hand side of the Bellman equation here in line 11. The right-hand side of the Bellman equation is utility plus beta times next period value at this point. Sorry, I should have should show you what R value computes. So let me run to this, run to the cursor again. Now we have k0 equal to zero and x is equal to zero again, okay. And let me step into the function R value. Well, first we step into, into the unit the utility and um, let me run to our values. So, sorry. So here we compute in this function, we compute next period value in the period 20. So now we consider a retired in his retirement period 19. In our value, we consider Compute the next period value function at year 20 in a retirement and at the next period asset level, in this case 0 0.0204. We have to check if we are outside the interval, then we return simply a negative, the high negative value. Now it's an interior case, and then we just interpolate the value function, the next period value function, which is stored in the vector vr1. So this is the value function of the 60-year-old, the one which is in the 20th years of his retirement, with capital stock at the first grid point where the capital stock is equal to zero, it's minus 10.82. The second grid point where his individual wealth is equal to 0 0.4, the value function is minus 2.35, and so on. As you can see, the value function behaves nicely. It's monotone. It increases monotonically. And in this line, in line 13, we interpolate the value function at point x. We, we supply the grid, the asset grid, the values of the value function, the grid point, and the method here is the interpolation method is linear. And this is the result of the linear interpolation, which we return to the calling function where we have the Bellman equation with utility plus beta times next period value function. And we continue to compute the value function. Let me go to the next iteration. Let me go to the next grid point here. Run to curve. So now we look at the case that the wealth level at age 59 in the 19th period of retirement is equal to 0 0.2041. The next grid point, the second grid point, I, IA is equal to 2.
we look at the case that next period asset so that our wealth at age 60 is equal to zero. Compute the Bellman, the right hand side of the Bellman equation inside the maximum bracket. So utility this period plus discounted value next period for capital stock, next period capital stock equal to zero. This provides us with the value minus 12.75. Because this is the first grid point we consider, the first next period grid point equal to zero that we consider. The value found minus 12.75 is larger than our initialization of minus one times 10 to the power 10. So this becomes our new optimum value in our search. And we store this grid point when it's the first grid point as our new points AX and BX for our goal section search. Our new optimum in our, in our search is allocated the value minus 12.75 and we search and consider the next grid point. So if we have for next period value 0 0.2041, I have a higher value of the right-hand side of the Bellman equation. And if this is the case, okay, we know, uh, well, K1 equal to zero is not optimal. Next optimal policy of our next period asset, we have to choose a higher point. So let us look at V1. Well, it's lower. V1, sorry, V1 is, is higher. So wonderful. <clears throat> we now know that our lower point AX is equal to zero. Our interior value is 0 0.204, and we continue to compute our search for the optimal interval for our goal section search. Now we have the third grid point, 0 0.4082. We compute the value of this for this point, and we get a negative of minus 1 to the times 10 to the power 10. Why? Because consumption in this case. If we save so much for age 60, it's negative, and as a consequence, our utility function u of m returns, returns in this case, oh, sorry, our, our value function here in this case, if c is smaller than zero, returns the value neg. So v1 in this case is not larger than V0. We have a decline in the value function. And that's wonderful now because we know our upper limit in our search for the maximum is Cx equal to 0 0.4082. So what we have identified is now the interval where we search for the maximum. We know that at point, grid point one, where asset, next period asset level is equal to zero, implies a value function that's below the grid point for next period, grid point A2 at 0 0.20, that's be, uh, is below this, this value function, the value of the value function at this point, sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and so we have, and at Cx equal to 0 0.4, the value function decreases again. So first it increases up when we have the point Bx, and it decreases at the point Cx. So therefore we know that our, our optimum must be between Ax and Cx, and Bx is an interior solution. And that's all what we need to provide for the maximization using golden section search. So this is specified as the function golden.m. Here we perform the maximization in one dimension over the, the, uh, the right-hand side of the Bellman equation, instantaneous utility plus discounted value next period which is saved as a 
function value one. It's an optimization over next period assets, the asset at age 60, A60. And we know that the maximum is between zero and 0 0.48. And Bx is an, in, is an intermediate value, an interior value. And the tolerance, we stop uh, when two consecutive values for x, uh, by the difference is below 10 to the power minus 8. So our optimal value here for the next period capital stock at age 60 is 0 0.13094. Uh, we store this in our variable, in our policy matrix here, AR opt for an initial capital stock, IA and H, I equal to 19 in retirement. We compute the associate value of the value function with this optimal solution. And we store the consumption function at asset level 0 0.2041, the second grid point pension is equal to 0 0.0835, and the optimal policy function is our 0 0.1394. And we continue to compute the optimal policy function and the value function for all retirees. And now let me jump to to the problem of the worker. Sorry, one thing I would like to point out, that's the use of M0. In M0, we save the optimal value in the last iteration. So we have M0 here. Um, if we found a grid point that increases the, the value function, the right hand side of the Bellman equation. Now we can, one possibility would be to start our search for the interval that contains the maximum always at the first grid point. So start with next period as equal to zero and, and go up. But of course, this implies that we always have to do a lot of iteration. If, if we are lucky, we have to do this iteration over all grid points, in our case 50, but in future, applications a couple of thousand points perhaps. So this is time consuming. We know that the value function is monotone, as we have just seen it increases with the present period, current period asset level. So why don't we take the last interval as initial guess as our starting point and see if the lower interval limit is pushed up by one or two or three or just a couple of values and do not evaluate all the grid points that are below our lower limit of the interval that we found in the last iteration. And this is stored in M0 and therefore we can save a lot of iterations if we do not evaluate our right-hand side of the Bellman equation for all grid points, but just for those which are at least as large as those found in the last iteration with a lower wealth level at HS. Okay, so let's run to, to the cursor which we have placed in line 232. Two. And this takes a couple of seconds while we, we get there. And we also will see our optimal policy functions in a in the minute here, here's our value function over the individual asset space 0 to 10. Next, we have our optimal consumption function of the 41-year-old. And finally, we have the optimal next period asset level. Okay, now we're in the part where we compute the Bellman problem, dynamic problem. For the, for the worker. Again, we do the iteration at age i equal to 40. 
and the first grid point is zero. So we consider the optimal policy function of the 40 year old with the zero value. And let me jump to the, we assume that the next period asset wealth, so optimal policy function should be zero. And we wonder what is the right hand side of the Bellman equation that is associated with such a policy. So this period wealth, k0 equal to zero, k1, next period wealth, k also equal to zero. And we compute the value, uh, the right hand side of the Bellman equation for this individual. So let's step into the function value 2.m, which is also stored as a separate script here in the directory. And we set the global variable k1 equal to zero. Now we have a separate, an additional optimization problem for the worker. He must find his optimal labor supply. And we know that our optimal labor supply, the condition here is just the first order condition of the optimal labor supply, which we name the variable n. And our, the value that we have computed for n here is 0 0.33. So it's locked between 0 and 1. Wonderful, no problem. If not, we have to set it to the lower or upper limit, 0 and 1. We compute the consumption that associated with this labor supply. So here we have the wage income plus the interest income, which is 0 because k0 is zero and next period wealth is also equal to zero. If our consumption is below zero, we return a high negative value here. Thanks God that's not the case. And we can compute the right hand side of the Bellman equation. We have to distinguish two cases. We have to distinguish the worker at age 40 who becomes a retiree next year. Therefore next period value function is the value function of the retiree, which is stored, computed in R value, in the function R value. In case our worker is 39 years or younger, then he is also a worker next period, and we have to compute the value function of the worker in period plus one, which is the current period, the current age that we consider. So in our case, we consider the worker at age 40, so we have to compute next period value function at x equal to zero, at wealth equal to zero of the agent who is one year in retirement. Okay, so that's all that's changed that's changed between the optimization problem of the retiree and the worker. And let's step out of this of this value function computation here. And the rest is just the same as before. We keep on searching over all the grid points of the grid, a grid, 0, 0 0.2041, 0 0.408, until the value of the value function decreases for this next period asset value. Then we have found the upper limit of our interval, interval where we look for the search for the maximum and we have also kept we have also kept track of the in lower limit of the interval that's where our value function was below the optimal which is stored in point ax and bx was is our maximum solution if we just look at the individual grid points and again we search for the inner solution here in, let's run to the curve, in line 293, using gold section search. So in this case, we have the lower limit zero, the interior solution 0 0.2041, that's our maximum that we found by looking at the individual grid points, and the upper limit 0 0.4082 for the upper limit where, we are, where the value function starts to decline again. We maximize the value function value two now and 
we find an optimal value equal to 0 0.2535. So for the 40-year-old worker who is a retired person next period, it is up to who has asset at the amount of zero in at age 40, it is optimal to increase wealth up to 0 0.2535 at age 41. That's this optimal policy with respect to labor. And with respect to his asset, his next period wealth, which we store in the matrix AW opt, so asset of the worker optimal next next period value, given his initial wealth at the grid point one at age forty. And we also store is labor supply n equal to 0 0.5147 at this grid point and compute consumption that's associated with this optimal labor supply 0 0.5147 and optimal next period capital stock 0 0.2535. Store all these values in the policy function CW opt and w opt and the value function at this point and next we just iterate over all the policy functions at age 38 37 36 35 and so on until we have found the solution so notice that this value function infinite time we just have to iterate once over the value function and have found the solution. It's different than from value function in infinite time, which we might know from the Ramsey model, um, where you have to start with a guess for the value function and then compute the solution as just one value function by iterating over this value function. And due to the contracting mapping theory, you know that this kind of procedure converges. Here it's easy, we have the finite time dynamic pro programming problem, and we can solve it in just one iteration and find, for example, here the value function of the one-year-old, sorry, the one-year-old, and similarly, consumption of the one-year-old and the asset level of the one-year-old, and finally, the employment, a labor supply of the one-year-old, which you know from the start of this video here. Okay, we have now computed the optimal policy function, have solved the individual optimization problem, and now we just do the aggregation. And there we, we start at h s equal to one and, and iterate forward in time. So we store the optimal profile of the wealth in the vector kg or capital stock generational capital stock here and similarly for for um, labor supply over the 40 years as an as a worker consumption oops, and compute the optimal, the optimal capital stock profile, wealth age profile, labor supply age profile, and consumption age profile. Therefore, we start with the initial value at age one, which we know. The household is born without any wealth. He uh, has initial capital stock zero. And then we iterate over his lifetime from one until the age 59. Compute this next period optimal wealth. We have stored this in, in our policy function aw opt. Therefore, we have to interpolate our values of the optimal policy function at the grid point at the grid point kg dot j dot of j. So let me go back. We start in the first period with zero capital. 
at H1. At H1, our optimal next period capital, for example, is 0 0.1. We use this next period value to find again the optimal capital stock, the optimal asset, at H3. Therefore, we have to interpolate our optimal policy function here at the H1. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry for this. Uh, for this little, this, uh, this little confusion here. So we start at H1. Now that we have initial capital stock of zero, we look at our optimal policy function at H1. Sorry for this. <laughs> and uh, and know that the optimal policy function at the asset level zero is provided by our policy function AW opt. And we interpolate it here at this position. This becomes our next period wealth. Our loop goes on for another, another period for another year. And we provide this new value as an input in our linear interpolation of the optimal policy function to find the optimal asset level in at H3, and so on. And while we do this loop, we also compute the labor supply from our optimal condition here, optimality condition, or consumption, and store. Once we have found these new profiles for the optimal capital stock and the optimal label, we compute aggregates. So our aggregate capital stock is just the average capital stock of our households and update K bar, 80% of the old value, 20% of our new found value of the aggregate capital stock. And we also update employment and we know that an aggregate labor is simply average labor supply times the number of workers which have measured to third. And we update until this procedure converges, save our results, and display the computational time and plot our optimal policy functions over the lifetime. Okay, so this terminates here our consideration of the optimal policy function, the computation of the, of the labor consumption wealth age profile with the help of value function iteration. We have found that value function is slow, much slower than, than direct computation with the newton Ramsey algorithm. So whenever possible, use this method. It is much more reliable, it's faster, much faster, by a factor of 100, 1000, or even more, and it is more accurate. But sometimes you have problems, uh, dynamic programming problems, dynamic optimization problems in large scale overlapping generations model that you cannot solve with this method. In particular, if you have so many agents that you cannot compute each path or each individual. So if you have Stochastic income, stochastic productivity, it's impossible to use this method. Then you have to rely on a method like, like value function iteration. And this becomes feasible if you have a state space of one dimension, so asset space, as we just did. But it becomes very tricky and is subject to the curse of dimensionality if you have a high dimensional asset space, so for example, individual assets, accumulated human capital, uh, your family, for example, if you have children, keep track of the number of children. If you have parents, you're nice and they leave bequests to you, you already behave different. So the wealth of your parents may be a state variable. Rich kids behave differently than poor kids. And they know they will get, sometimes a huge bequest is waiting for them, they behave differently. So, we might have a system like in Germany where the pension depends very much, almost 100% on the contribution that you, that you do to the social security system. 
So this might be another state where will your contributions to the pension system. Now, if the asset space becomes large, especially in terms of the continuous states like assets, bequests, and individual contributions, you have problems computing them with value function value. There are times when you're lucky, for example, that your function is always linear in a particular state, state for example, in, in bequests or in, in human capital. Then you just need a few grid points in your approximation. But if your value function is very concave, like you just saw with regard to, to the individual asset space, if you have a lot of curvature, uh, you need many points to, to uh, make an accurate approximation of your value function. And then in my experience, if you have more than, well, two, three, three indiv uh, individual states are already hard to handle, but with four or five with current computer technology, it becomes basically impossible to handle. And it also depends on the software that you're using. So we've seen that MATLAB, the code, the one-to-one -one translation of the Gauss code into MATLAB is smaller, uh, sorry, slower, slower <laughs> by a factor of 100 or 1,000 even in comparison to Gauss. And Gauss is already slower than many other programs. So for example, there are very nice software freeware which you can download for nothing, um, like Julia or Python, uh, which are again about 10 times faster than, than Gauss. And um, my co-authors use these programs now, Julia uh, and, and Python, because these large-scale overlapping generations problems, with, which are the interesting problems that you would like to consider, um, are so takes so much time, computational time, that it almost becomes impossible with method. So sorry for this bad news, but once you compute the really interesting problems, for example, if you also consider the transition the demographic transition and need to compute the value function duration problem in for each individual, let's say until the year 2200, because over this period, the aggregate capital stock will change and we do not have a steady state. Well, then good luck with MATLAB. So um, this might become very tricky and you need to apply much more sophisticated code than I used here. I used a very simple code. This code, I used this code because I wanted to, to teach you how to write simple programs in MATLAB. But then you need to apply much, much more sophisticated model in order to speed up the code. And um, you may want to consider other computer software like Julia and Python in order to get the same results with, which, with a simpler code in the same time or much faster. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this uh, excursion into dynamic program, which the great Richard Bauman already came up with during the 50s when of course uh, computer technology, modern computer technology was not inside. Um, and I hope you keep on using this code this MATLAB code on value function iteration and on direct computation to compute more interesting pro problems in pension policies. And uh, well, in the next video, you will find out how to use the direct computation method to compute um, to compute the so-called level curve. So uh, we will apply our method to a large scale overlapping generation model with many hundred variables and find out uh, the level curve when we increase social security taxes and income taxes. Of course, this will have an effect on labor supply and we uh, will track this in a large scale model. And there the problem is to come up with an initial value for the newton Repson algorithm. And this is by no means simple.